Have I con? Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, you can. Maybe we'll start because uh, I don't want to keep people waiting. So uh, we haven't actually. I think Rabbi Khan, last time you spoke to our community was it last Arab Pesach? Could very so, well be. <laughs> so uh, first of all, on behalf of Fifth Avenue Synagogue, I want to thank Rabbi Khan, uh, who has a very busy schedule, always makes time for our uh, community and extended community. Uh, Pesach is a very uh, spiritual, special time, and uh, we thought it was important to learn with Rabbi Khan before uh, Pesach comes, so we don't miss this great opportunity. And uh, we know uh, hearing words of Torah from Rabbi Khan will ensure that we all don't uh, miss this amazing opportunity coming up. And uh, Rabbi Babich will be coming on soon. But uh, in the interest of time, I wanted uh, Rabbi Khan to please uh, start uh, for this evening. And again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Khan. My biggest pleasure, Jacob. I go back a long time, and it's always a pleasure. And as I've always mentioned, Chazam Malavani and some of the other people that are connected to the show in one way or another, and Rabbi Babbage, of course, so uh, we, have, we have a connection. We have a connection. Rabbi Roth also. Well, we go, that's right, Rabbi Roth, and uh, go back to Rabbi Shulman, and uh, was way, way back, way, way, way back. Right. Oh, Hashem. You know, the I had something of an epiphany about the Haggadah, which is really strange because I've been learning, not just reciting the Haggadah, which all of us do, but I've been learning the Haggadah with my Talmidim for, I, I would say, for at least 50 years. 5 0, 50 years. And you always wonder is there anything more that you could learn or anything more of an insight that you can see or feel? And it begins to get a uh, you get a sense that whatever needs to be said, someone certainly said it, and and at some point I must have absorbed it and assimilated it. I've heard about the Haggadah from Rav Soloveitchik, Zechayin Levracha, many, many times. So how can you come up with a new idea or, or, or perceive something new? But I did. I really did. I feel that I have a certain insight to share with everyone that is perhaps a little bit unique. The Rambam, when he begins to give you the text of the Haggadah, now mind you, the Rambam has the halachas of Sipur Yitzias Mitzrayim, of how to conduct the Seder. He gives you the details of how to conduct the Seder in the time of the Beis Amigdash, and alternatively in our time when there is no Beis Amigdash and there is no Karban Pesach. But besides everything, the Rambam, in his great work, the Yad HaChazoka, the great work of Mishnah Torah, his code of law, he has the texts of the davening, Shachris, Min Chamayrev, the Shon Esrei, Shabbos davening, Yom Tov davening, but he also has the text of the Haggadah. And the Rambam, at the beginning, he has sort of a heading. And he says, this is the text of the Haggadah that Jews use in the time of their exile. Now, it's very interesting. When the Rambam speaks in his laws, he says, this is how it is, Bizman Shabes Hamigdash Kayom. And then he writes, Bizman Hazeh. When he wants to speak about the way we conduct the Seder and the laws that are applied to us, today, which means in his time, but it's the same as today, he is going to tell you bizman azeh. Like by Yomim Ahim, bizman azeh. Bizman azeh means in our time, when we don't have the Beis HaMikdash, when we don't have the Karban Pesach. However, at the heading, he doesn't use the word bizman azeh. He didn't write, this is the Haggadah Nusach, that we recite Bizman Hazeh. He says, in our exile. Now, somebody would not pay the slightest attention to that. What's the difference? It is in our exile and it's Bizman Hazeh. But to me, it was saying something. I think that if you think about it for a moment, we do something extraordinary heroic when we recite the Haggadah. 
And I would almost suggest that it's practically absurd to recite the Haggadah. But that's why it's so heroic. Rabbi, just to be clear, if Mashiach comes, will we have a Seder? You, you, you know, when Mashiach comes. Sometimes I very much welcome questions. But okay, sorry. Questions that throw me into another planet, that's not something I can handle right okay, now. Sorry, sorry. You know, because otherwise we'll be here after the proverbial Chatzos Halayla, you know. But, but uh, this is where we are right now. And that's what I want to talk about exactly. That we're not yet in the times of Mashiach. That's the whole point. Why is that? Why does that so troubling to me? So think about it for a minute. How do we begin the Seder and how do we end the Seder? The last thing that we say the night of the Seder. The first thing we say is Halach Anya. This is the bread of affliction. There's a very famous marshal of the Dubna Magid, probably well known to the people. The Dubna Magid said there was once a very, very poor person who suddenly became extraordinarily wealthy. And to remember the way it was in the bad times, he used to get his family together. They would dress in rags the way they were once dressed. And they would eat a very simple fare, maybe some bread and water because that's what they had in the old times. To remember to be grateful, to remember to appreciate what they had now, now that they were living in the lap of luxury. Well, Vahi Hayom, it happened that they became, unfortunately, poor all over again. The pater familias, the head of the family, lost his money. The rest of the family was spread out and everyone was totally dependent upon him. He was the brains of the operation. He provided the funds. He was the one who gave them whatever they had. And when he went down, they also went down, but they didn't realize it. And in fact, he invited everyone to come and spend that day with them together. And he gives them simple fare and he provides them with tatters and then he says to them, this is not a make-believe. This is not a commemoration. This is the way we are, unfortunately, because I lost all my money. There's a difference between saying, kehol achma anya, says the Dubna Magid, and hol achma anya. The chaf is like, it's like the bread of affliction, but it's not the bread of affliction. But Halach Manyas, this is the bread of affliction. When we say it, we say Halach Manya, this is the bread of affliction. And a proof of it is that we say two statements. Whoever is poor, whoever is needy, but then we say something else. The second statement. This year, we are where we are. We are here. The Shona Haba next year, may it be that we are Ba'ara de Yisrael in the land of Israel. Ashata this year, Avde, we are slaves. The Shona Haba Bnei Next year we will be free people. You talk about Mashiach. This is a prayer for Mashiach. In other words, every single Jew, including those who are in Eretz Yisrael. The night of the Seder, they say these words, we are all slaves. That's a very strange way to begin the night of the Seder's declaration of freedom. You ever pay attention to that? The first thing that comes out of our mouth, before Manishtana, we are slaves, next year we will be free. The Shona Haba B'nei Chorin. How do we end the Haggadah? What's the very last thing that we say in the Haggadah? The very last thing that we say in the Haggadah is L'shona Abba B'Yerushalayim. Well, of course, why not? It's the most beautiful thing. L'shona Abba B'Yerushalayim. B'Yerushalayim ha It's 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 a very, very poignant expression, and it has two faces to it. It has a face of hope, and it has a face of despair. You know why it has a face of despair? 
There are two Yomim Tovim only that we end with the Shona Habab Yerushalayim, Pesach night and Yom Kippur night. When Yom Kippur is over, we say the Shona Habab Yerushalayim. You know why? It's not Stam a dream for Mashiach. It's because on both of these days, while we are not in the good times, we don't have the mainstay of the day. We are disemboweled. We are missing not a detail, not a side post. We are missing the fundamental arch of the whole Yom Tif. The whole Yom Tif of Yom Kippur is missing the Avodas Kohen Godol. It's missing the Avoda, the service in the Beis Hamikdash. Without the service in the Beis Hamikdash, we go into such a tailspin on Yom Kippur. I don't know if you noticed it so clearly, but after we describe what happened in the Beis Hamikdash, we go over the entire Avoda in our davening in Musaf. We then start saying what is nothing less than kinos, like we do on Tisha B'Av. Lamentations. And the reason, in fact, the 10 great tzaddikim, tanoim, asara haruge malchus, they're described on Tishabav and they're described on Yom Kippur. You know why? Because on Yom Kippur, after imagining the, in an almost euphoric kind of way what it was like for the Kohen Gadol to work in the Beis Hamikdash and then come out, Mare Kohen. And all of a sudden, we wake up from our reverie and say, Oy vey, but we don't have any of that. What kind of a Yom Kippur do we have? And the same thing is true the night of Pesach. The reason we say L'shana Abab Yerushalayim by both of them is because the mainstay is missing. We don't have the carbon Pesach. It's not just the carbon Pesach. It's not just the carbon Pesach. It's the whole tekes, the whole ceremony, the whole celebration. Throngs of people millions maybe, came to Yushalayim to celebrate, to be together. It was something that was such a marvel that even Goyim wrote about it in those days. And we don't have any of that. It's taka a miracle we have Eretz Yisrael. It's an incredible thing. There's a Medina, for better or for worse, but there's a Medina. But how could you compare? We're threatened on all sides. Here is an Iran and here's an United States. We're worried, are they happy with them? Are they not happy with them? This is freedom. This is a country that's truly free. And the kinna, the kinna is unbelievable. You look at this tiny little country and what they accomplished, which is miraculous in its own right. And it's impossible to even describe. In every area of human endeavor, they are in the top 10, top 15 countries. Uh, Klein Lendela, the size of New Jersey, with 9 million people, and on the top, top? It's unbelievable. You send up your own satellites? This is unheard of. You have, you have medical advances that the whole world envies. You change, you grow tomatoes in sand? It's mind-boggling. You create... Uh, a variety of, 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 of you know, implements to help a paraplegic that he should be able to walk. It's not a volume. Not to mention the massive amount of Torah that's going on. Massive. The Sfarim. Jealousy, Rabbi said. You know, the, the Gemara says, why was the mountain called Sinai? Because Sinai is sinner. Hatred. Because when the Jews were given the Torah, hatred came down against them from all the Umas HaElah. And it's not going to change until Yemei Samashiach. When we go into the Haggadah and we do not have the carbon Pesach, it's not just the carbon Pesach. We don't have normalcy. We don't have freedom because we don't have peace and quiet. That's what we say at the beginning of the Haggadah and at the end of the Haggadah, that we are still avoided. And if we're not avodim to this, we're avodim to that. We're avodim to our smartphones. We're avodim around and around. And these avodim are supposed to come on the night of Pesach and declare that they are free. And I think that that's an incredible thing. I, I, I think it's something almost that borders on the absurd. 
But if you think about what borders on the absurd, how did anyone have a say there? And there are many descriptions of it in an Auschwitz, in a Treblinka, in this lager, in, in Stutthof, in, in, in the Vilna ghetto, in the Warsaw ghetto, in the Lodger ghetto, in the Kovna ghetto. How do you have a say there in the Kovna ghetto? When any minute they're going to destroy all of you. The Lithuanians came and before the Germans even had a chance, they were ready to tear us to shreds. Like in the Chmelnitsky massacres and all the pogroms, this is, this is not so long ago. I am myself consider myself a survivor because I was born before the ink was dried on the on the uh, the end of the war. To end the war on that agreement to end the war, I was born before that. I'm I'm a, a stickle survivor. And the stories that my father told me spent all those years in the Vilna ghetto. It's no revaya. We are still avodim. Where do we come to make a, a sipa yitzias mitzrayim? We are free. And we declare that we are avodim. Hashata avde l'shona abo b'nei choyre. And then we say manishtana alai wabazeh. So I had a, a, an incredible awareness. An incredible awareness. There's a statement in the Gemara, one line, half a line. Maschil begnus u mesayim b'shevach. Gnus is something that's negative, that's wrong, that's hurtful. Gnus, something that's inappropriate sometimes. Shevach, everybody knows what shevach means. Shevach is praise. You begin, in other words, with the story of Mitzrayim, you cannot begin with the good part, that we came out of Mitzrayim. You have to start with the negative. We were slaves. So there's an opinion in the Mishnah, the statement in the Mishnah, and you analyze the parsha of Arami Oved Ovi, which we do in the Haggadah very thoroughly. He analyzed every word and every phrase of that section called Arami Oved Ovi. But what's interesting is that the Gemara comments upon this expression. He begins with the negative and ends with the positive and explains that there are two different negatives and two different positives. And according to the Rambam and according to our Haggadah, every one of us reads that in the Haggadah, we do both. First, we start that way, way, way long ago in ancient Hori history, our ancestors worshipped Avodah we worshipped idols in the time of Terach, the father of Abraham. And now, now we became intimates of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We are so close to Hashem. Achshav HaKervonu HaMokam L'Avodosa. HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought us close to his service. Kervonu HaMokam L'Avodosa. Bitchilo Ovdei Avodah Zorah Hayu. That's the negative. Achshav Kervonu is the positive. HaKadosh Baruch brought us close to him. We became the servants of Hashem. We became Hashem's Am Hanivcha, the chosen people. He took us out of Mitzrayim and he gave us a Torah. Then, we also have to say, we were physically enslaved in Egypt and HaKadosh Baruch took us out and set us free so that we could determine our own destiny. We were no longer bound to Paro, and we were no longer slaves in Egypt. The negative and the positive. And this was my epiphany. We start with the spiritual, and we continue with the physical. In the physical, before we begin the parish of Arami Roy Benavi, we say something interesting. The promise that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made to Avram stood by us because not one tyrant wanted to destroy us. Shalom echad bilvad omad oleinu l'chaloseinu. Elo shebechol dor oimdim oleinu l'chaloseinu. In every generation, they tried to destroy us. 
This is an ancient text, and it's a text that's as alive, unfortunately, and as real, unfortunately, today as it ever was. Oimdim aleinu Give Iran a chance, lower your guard. That's it. And nothing is going to help you. We're only dependent on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So as strong as we think we are and as strong as we want to be, there's always someone that's trying to destroy us. What do they have to do with us? What are they busy with us? You can't ask questions like that. Because the Chal Dor Vadar Omdim Aleinu L'Chal Oseinu. V'cha Kodesh Baruch Hu Matzileinu Miyodah. And I'll tell you something else. It's not just the enemy with the missile or the bomb or the gun or the knife. There was one of the Hasidic Rebbes was called the Koshnitzer Magid. He was the Magid, the, 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 the Darshan of Koshnitz, very, very prominent Hasidic figure. The Kajan Samagat had a story, a marshal, obviously. It's not a real story. But he said that there was a very ignorant couple, very ignorant. I mean, really, really. But they recited the Haggadah. Apparently, he knew how to read, and he recited the Haggadah to his wife. All of a sudden, in the middle of his recitation, which was going by very nicely, he starts screaming on the top of his lungs, Chometz, Chometz. And she says, what is it? He says he found Chometz in the Haggadah. Found Chometz in the Haggadah? <laughs> That's impossible. First of all, she says she cleaned the house. It, it, it was, wasn't the 12-room house. It was a 20-room house. <laughs> it was a, a house and, 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 le, and half a room. So she cleaned it thoroughly. There's no Chometz. No Chometz. He says to her, I found Chometz in the Haggadah itself. She says, where? He says, it says, Oimdim aleinu l'chaliseinu. I found chalis in the Haggadah. Bulkalach, bagels, chala. I found chalis in the Haggadah. Sounds absurd, no? It's a, it's a peculiar story. And they're getting very, very unnerved. There's, there's chametz in the Haggadah. But two seconds later, he says, ah, it's okay, it's okay. We can calm down. She says, what? She says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took those chalas and turned them into matzahs. It says, right after that, it says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu matzaleinu miyodo. It's matzah, it's not chala. Now that's one of the most absurd <laughs> parables I've ever heard, is it not? And, and after thinking about it, it's not at all. Because you see, when you're in the exile, this is what happened to the Jews in Egypt. It happened in, in Germany. It happened in Hungary. It happened in Poland. It happened in America. You know, the, 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 the rate of, of, of assimilation intermarriage in the European countries, I don't know. There must be 90%, 95%. I don't know. There's no such thing as intermarriage anymore. That's marriage. The exception to the rule is the Jew that realizes he's Jewish and wants to marry a Jewish girl. You think that that's not l'chaloseinu to destroy us? You think that when you have that kind of situation where, where there are Jews who, who think that to, 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 be, to be antagonistic to the Medina Yisrael is a virtue, it, 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 it becomes a plus, it, 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 it's almost like you're not a good citizen of any country unless you hate Eretz Yisrael, unless you call them an apartheid state. When, 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 when half the doctors in the hospital are Arabs, call them an apartheid state. And if you don't do that, there's something wrong with you. You're not woke. You're a bigot. You're a tyrant. That's not assimilation, that a Jew should be so far gone that he should not have any hasoga of the sense that he belongs to this Medina, that he's part of Eretz Yisrael, that this is the crowning glory of the last 75 years? How is that possible? The answer is, they turned into Hametz. And it's the very, very few 
that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made back into matzahs. Very few. So when we say, that all those people that hemorrhaged, with shmad or assimilation or this or that, and he was prescient because in his time it wasn't nearly as bad. But there was an intuition. You're amongst the goyim by yisarvu by goyim by yomidumi maaseyem, and this is what happens. So when we read the Haggadah and we say bechol dor v'dor omdim aleinu lechaloseinu, we know whereof we we speak, and and it's true today as much as it ever was. I wondered to myself how a person in Auschwitz was able to say the next words vakodesh bochum matzileinu miyodam and smell the burning flesh in the smokestacks. It's a peculiar kind of absurd heroism. So, so the Haggadah is fraught with mention of the fact that things are not right. Our declaration of freedom is in the midst of very, very clear indications that things are not right today. Today means today, means yesterday, means 100 years ago, 5,000 years ago. I mean, I mean, I mean 500 years ago and 1,000 years ago. It doesn't make any difference if it's the Crusades or Chmelnitsky or the pogroms. My Shrev's parents were killed in, in Vilna. They were killed. Sadikim she'en kemoisam. Somebody once said after the Chafetz Chaim was nifted, they asked Rebbe Chonav Asiman, who was his closest Talmud. Everybody knows that connection Rebbe Chonav Asiman had to the Chafetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim's Levaya, what's going to be now? He says, as long as we have the Haradaka Rav, that was my father-in-law's father, as long as Haradaka Rav is alive, we have a chance. Murdered by the Nazis. But his parents were murdered in a pogrom in the Ukraine. The guy said, Sadikim don't. Unbelievable what we've gone through and what we are going through. And still we say the Haggadah. And in the Haggadah itself, we remind ourselves. The beginning, at the end, in the middle. How do we do that? How do we manage to do that? The answer is because there's two negatives and two positives. If the whole Haggadah was the physical coming out of Mitzrayim, I don't think there would be a Haggadah today. How could there be? But that's not what happened. We didn't just come out of Mitzrayim. Hashem took us into his bosom. Hashem said, you are mine, exclusively mine. You are going to be my people. No matter what. The whole Hazinu describes how bad we are. And Hashem says, I know all about it. I anticipate it. I accept it. I don't want it. I'm not happy with it. But that's not going to change my relationship with you. Even one iota. Because you are the chosen people. The Haggadah says that no matter how bad it gets, we have the ultimate freedom of belonging to Hashem. And that's why the physical negative and positive is completely dependent upon the spiritual positive. That Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim and cleaned us up those 49 days and gave us the Torah and said, at Har Sinai, you will be mine forever. This is the secret of the Haggadah. That no matter how bad it is, and no matter how much we are saying we are slaves, and tomorrow it's going to be in Eretz Yisrael, Yushalayim, Lashon Ababishlayim, because today we don't have that. And in the middle, we say in every generation, they're going to try to destroy us, and we know we're, we know exactly what they mean. Because when they wrote it, there wasn't yet a Hitler. But now there's a Hitler in our history. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring. No one ever knows what tomorrow will bring. It's only a fool who could say that from now on it's okay. Jacob asked me at the beginning, so what's going to be in the time of Mashiach? And the Rambam more or less says, well, we don't really know exactly what's going to be in the time of Mashiach, but we yearn for it just the same. But while we are yearning for it, we celebrate every single Pesach. Every single place of them, say the night, gathering our family around us, we say all those negative things, notwithstanding, 
we have something that no nation in the world has, that unique connection to Hashem. And that, I believe, is how it was possible to celebrate Pesach in an Auschwitz or in a Vilna ghetto. My father had to go from place to place. Every once in a while, the Polak that was hiding them, my parents, they were already married. They had just gotten married and the Nazi came. And they were the 200 survivors of 80,000 Jews. 200 remained alive in the Vilna ghetto. They had one aktsia after another, that was like the elimination of the Jews. And they rounded them up and they threw them into pits and they shot them, some of them but buried alive, right outside Vilna in a forest called Panari. Anyone who doesn't know can read about it. It's very, very available. 80,000 Jews, there were 60,000 Jews in Vilna that lived in Vilna and right at the beginning of the war, as you know, many people fled to Vilna because they thought they would be safe in the Lithuanian Republic. And the Litvina were worse, those collaborators were worse than the Nazis themselves. They took a special joy in torturing and killing Jews as quickly and as enjoyably as possible. When you have that as your backdrop, you can't go in to a Pesach with we were slaves and then Hashem set us free. So good, he set us free. Look where we are today. I'm talking about those who were in Vilna at that moment. You know, there was a little boy. My father told this to me so many times. And every time he told it to me, he just started to cry. My father was not that type, but he couldn't help himself. There was a little boy, Moishala. And Moishala was being hid, but in the open. Because children at the age of two and three, you couldn't hide them. Because you couldn't put them in a closet or behind a wall or, or in an attic. And they should stay there permanently and you should bring the food and take out the, 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 the junk. These were kids. These were babies. So the only Yetzir was to keep them out in the open. And of course, there may have been an occasional Polak, a Lithuanian in Vilna who was decent, but most of the time they were bribed. They were paid. They had no money, so they just they took the risk. Because if they were found out, it was a sure, sure thing. That they would be taken away also. So this Moshua used to go to sleep at night and they used to say, Marek, Marek, go to sleep in Polish. They spoke Polish there. Marek, go to sleep. And he would say in Yiddish, Ich bin nicht Mare, Ich bin Moishele. And my father was hiding in the attic in that house. And every time he heard that, his heart was breaking. Anyhow, eventually, you know what happened? My father told me that he then went to some other place and then to a third place. They were, they were, they, my father had stories, Nisim and Eflois, over and over again. How only the Rebbe Shalom saved them. But he found out later that when these people revealed where they had kept their jewelry and uh, they were apparently substantial people and they had a lot of money, that the minute the Polak found out where the money was, he gave away the child to the Nazis. My nomen is nicht Marek. My nomen is Moishele. My father used to start to cry. If this, that Moishele, then in Vilna, you have no explanation that you are making a seder. What are you being grateful for? So the answer is you're grateful for that they're killing you. Because the whole world is in one way or another acknowledging that you are the chosen people and they don't like it. And the Christians especially. I used to read these things, Greek and Latin. I once fancied myself a bit of an expert on these religions. And he used to read what they write in the original, the patristic fathers. Thousands of pages of spewing animosity and hatred against the Jews. 
the contra Judeorum, against the Jews, left and right. And saying there's no, they no longer the people of the covenant. They are no longer the chosen people. They are no longer the people of the covenant. The people of the covenant is the whole world, as long as you accept Yoshke Pandra. This is it. And the Yid in Vilna says to himself, I belong to Hashem, my people belong to Hashem, and we are the only ones that belong to Hashem in that way. A guy can go to Shamayim, a guy can have Oilam Abba, a guy can have Schar, a guy can have the Mekayim Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noyach. But unless he becomes a Ger, the door is open to all Goyim. But unless he becomes a Ger, he's not going to be part of the chosen people. And we are born into the chosen people. And I just want to finish with a very fascinating thing. The Rambam, the same Ramamadis, the Rambam, he has the laws of conversion in an interesting place. And he writes there, how do you receive a ger? How, do, how does Bezdin react to a convert when he wants to come and be a convert? So par paraphrasing the Gemara, Yuvamis, the Rambam says the following. We say to the ger, I'm, I'm saying it by heart, so I may not get every word exactly right. What in the world seized you? What insanity seized you, basically, he's saying, in a polite way. To want to be mitztarif to this people. Don't you know that Yisrael and he has a whole list of words and the Yisurim boyin alehem? Why do you want to be a ger? Why would you want to be part of the Jewish people and suffer their sufferings and their humiliations and their abuses? Why? And then it says in the Rambam, and he has to answer, Yodeya Ani, I know, Ve'eni Kedai, I am not worthy of it. I know that I'm not worthy but I'd like to be part of the people of Israel anyhow. What does it mean he's not worthy? He's not worthy of all that suffering. That's what he's saying. I'm not worthy. But what does that mean? It means because you're the chosen people. When we go to the Seder and we say we were set free, were it not for that spiritual component, we wouldn't be able to say a single word. Because in so many different ways we are slaves. We say at the beginning, Hashata Avde. We say at the end, Shana Bob We don't even have the, the carbon Pesach, the Bani Shalaylam. What kind of a Seder is this? And then in the middle, Bechol Dor Vador Every generation they want to destroy us. That's some total of our freedom. So what kind of freedom is that? What kind of a Seder are we having? What kind of absurdity is this? But the Territ says, you don't only say the negative and the positive of the physical. You say it of the spiritual as well. On the spiritual level, we were slaves. The Baruch Hu made a master plan for the world. And he chose Avram. And that continues and continues until finally he took all people out from amongst the Egyptians at the last second and polished them off, cleaned them up, and gave them a Torah and said to them, Atem kadosh. And it never changed, never once changed. When we sing Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, Ki Onu Amecha, Ba'ato Lekeinu, Onu Banecha Ba'ato Avinu, and on and on, Onu Ma'ami Recha Ba'ato Ma'ami Reinu. It's one incredible song which has the same point over and over in so many different words. There is a unique umbilical connection between the Jew and God that no other nation has. And that gives us the right, the privilege, and the responsibility to say at the Seder night, we were slaves and we were set free. You should be zeicher that all the other parts should turn out all right. Now, Jacob, you could ask me what's going to be in Yemai Samashiach. And in Yemai Samashiach, we're going to have a carbon Pesach. In Yemai Samashiach, we're going to have a statement of freedom. But the, the Gemara already tells us that it's going to be so overwhelming, the victory, so overwhelming the success of Yemais HaMashiach, so will the Jews change 
the hearts of the Goyim in a positive way, that every guy is going to come and say, we want to learn from you, we want to follow you, we respect you, we cherish you, you are, you are the prize of the world. <laughs> it's almost hard to believe that such a thing could ever happen. But this is what it says. And you know what's fascinating? The first chapter of Yeshayahu, first Perek, is so negative that they chose it to be the Haftorah of the Shabbos, which gives it its name, Shabbos Chazon, the Shabbos right before Tisha B'Av, the, most lament, the, the greatest lament, the most serious and, 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 and harrowing capital in the whole Yeshayahu. The third chapter of Yeshayahu, totally negative. The second chapter of Yeshayahu, the vision that Yeshayahu saw Ba'achris Hayomim in the end of days. And he says how this mountain will be tall and famous and prominent in the whole world. And all the Goyim will run to it as if in a river. They will rush and they will say, Let us go up to the house, which is of the God of Jacob. And I learned that the God of Jacob is not the God of Abraham. So maybe that house belongs to Yishmael. And it's not the God of Isaac that maybe that house belongs to Esau. It's they all admit it belongs just to Jacob, just to Yaakov, just to Israel. It's their mountain. The Beis Hamikdash is their mountain. And they will say, "Teach us, inspire us, encourage us, show us the way." And then follows the most famous words that every single one of us knows, because we say it when we take out the Sefer Torah. See, when the Torah was given at Sinai, we had sinner. The world hates us. But there's going to come a point where that's going to change. And the world will admire us for what we have accomplished. They will admire us for our survival. They will admire us for being close to Hashem all those centuries. And they will say, teach us, inspire us. For out of Zion shall come forth the Torah to the whole world. And that will be a time, as the Rambam says, Hashem, We should be Zaycha to the Gula Shlema Amen. So 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 Rabbi, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to ask the question in the beginning, but so so time of Mashiach, we will have a Seder or not? Hundred percent. We will. Okay. We will. Okay. We will. And 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 it, it not only will we have a Seder, but there's not going to be anybody that's that poor. That has to come to our seder or to your seder. They're going to have their own seder. So halach man, everybody's going to be in Yerushalayim. Everybody's going to be in Yerushalayim, and everybody's going to have a carbon pesach. Amen. And that's what's described in Yecheskel and in other places. And that's what we yearn for, not for the carbon itself, but for that transformation of the world and their relationship to us. Rabbi Babish. Yes, uh, Rav Khan, thank you so much once again for uh, your moving and inspiring words before the Yom Tovim. As you definitely uh, elevate. Well, uh, 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 maybe next year, Taka and Yerushalayim. Amen, amen. Just uh, one quick question before we conclude. You mentioned that the um, the primary theme of, of the Seder is exp uh, understanding and appreciating and celebrating uh, the Kedusha Yisrael, that there's a special relationship between Jewish people and Hashem, and not necessarily the physical freedom, because as you say, that comes and goes throughout history. You know, um, being that the uh, a theme, a central theme on say the night is to teach the children. So if we are in foreign lands and we're not necessarily uh, as free as we would like to be, and there is assimilation and anti-Semitism around us, how does one exactly teach one's children this uh, you sow this foundation of, of feeling special if you know you are God forbid in a concentration camp or etc. Um, it's one thing for an adult to feel that, but how does one teach the children that, which is really the focus of Seder night? Well, one of the astonishing things about children is that they don't know the negative either. <laughs> they cannot really absorb or relate to the even to the current events. They're very busy in their own in their own way. It depends what you mean by children, but children. You're talking about young children, young young teenagers, or even younger. But you know, I don't have such children of my own. You know, there's a big question in halacha: if you have a grandfather, a father, and a son, who leads the seder? The grandfather. I mean, historically, who you know, who, 
In every family, I think the grandfather leads the Seder, if he knows, if he's capable. But the, but the Chiyav is, what's the obligation in the night of Pesach? A father and a son. So how do you deal with that? Because how do you explain that? You, you are leading the Seder. What role is the father here? You're talking to him, but you're even talking to the grandchildren. So you're speaking to your grandchildren and you're teaching them and, and they're asking you, you know, you sit there at the front of the, of the table, you know, like a king. And the children are all saying the Manishtana and they are addressing the Zayda. So there's a very interesting question, the Halacha Rav Sternberg talks about it, many talk about it. The bottom line though is, and this is the point, I think that when you have children at the table, my personal feeling would be to take advantage of the concept of slavery in a very, very psychological sense. Slavery is tic-tac. Slavery is the smartphone. Slavery is spending hours and hours in front of a ridiculous machine and, and wasting your life away. That's what slavery is. Slavery is not having respect because you've been absorbed the, the Goyesha attitude that the only thing that matters is me. And, and, and if a person could in any way convey that at the night of the Seder, I think he would be in a winning position. That's Thank you so much, Rav Khan. Do you have time for questions, Rav Khan? I have yeah. to go to a bar mitzvah, which I am already 15 minutes late. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> go right, Babish. Okay, thank you so much, Rav Khan. We wish you a Echad Kashi Pesameach. And then always, you know, we appreciate your friendship to our community. And please, uh, Bez Hashem, we should uh, celebrate again, as you said, in Yerushalayim, in good health. Uh, in hey, the, I mean, years please to come. give my warmest regards to your wonderful brother-in-law. That's Locha Rabba and uh, Jacob and everyone else. Bezes Hashem Yisbarach. We should talk be Zoycha. We should merit to fully understand and appreciate how close we are to Hashem, in spite of everything that appears in front of our eyes. It really is true. We have this unique connection that is never, ever going to break. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.